Thank you, Gleaves, for that suspiciously grudging introduction. <laughs> um, and thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for coming on such a beautiful evening at that. Uh, there's no echo that you can hear, is there? Hello? I'm audible, but there's no, no boom. All right. Uh, thank you very much for coming on such a beautiful evening. I think the lunch we had must have been even richer than I recall. It was an, an Irish snack. Um, the, Yeats's best poem, in my opinion, uh, an Irish airman foresees his death, isn't, isn't quite a hundred uh, lines long, but it seems as if it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's an extremely densely packed and uh, lavish um, poem. And I think perhaps, perhaps the nearest to a perfect poem in the 20th century. If asked, I can do it again. But I think I ought to keep my promise to talk about why Thomas Jefferson is the most uh, contemporary of our founding fathers. And I seized that chance because I thought that in, our, in the time we'll spend later together with question and answer, that if, if I don't give pretexts for more or less any topic to be raised, I will have failed very badly uh, in my mission statement. Um, I was asked earlier today what Thomas Jefferson would have thought about various contemporary things. And I... I said that it's a question I've often had to ask myself, and it's a question a historian almost certainly should never attempt to answer. I, I don't know about you, I find it annoying when people who write in biographies say, at a certain point, they'll say, a, 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 on this day, Mr. Washington or Mr. Madison must have thought. Well, you don't know that as a historian, and you shouldn't really try and say it. Um, I can only think of one exception to that which is I think that when Thomas Jefferson saw Halle Sally Hemings getting off the boat <laughs> in France, he may, for the first no time in his life, thought, there is a God. <laughs> um, that is absolutely as far as I'd want to push it, and one must be extremely <laughs> careful in, in asking what he might think about events today. If he could come back and be amongst us, I think he's, he's the founding father who'd have the best chance of understanding how the United States had evolved into what it has, by far. But the things that would amaze him would be, well, first and most salient, uh, the feistiness of American womanhood. Uh, that, even though he knew Abigail Adams and some other quite tough babes, he did not ever expect women to be very far out of the place in which they were in his lifetime. It wasn't a subject that aroused his curiosity, let alone his compassion. That, I think the, the sheer color and variety and sass of American womanhood would be the, the thing that would strike him most, and, and most amidships. Then, of course, he would be astonished to find how many of his and Sally's descendants are still alive. <laughs> and still reproducing. Um, a friend of mine, the, the very distinguished doctor, Annette Gordon-Reed, who's written the best book on this, so is in the process of tracking down and identifying and biographizing every single one of them. There are officers on both sides of our Civil War from that family, for example, very fascinating one. Um, and on both sides of what used to be vulgarly called the color line. Sally and her children all passed as white in the census of 1820. Some of them opted to remain African-American later. Um, many, of course, of them have married again and, and contributed even more to the melting pot. It's actually a very extraordinarily touching story. It seems a shame to me that Sally Hemings is buried under the Hampton Inn parking lot in Charlottesville. I think it should be thought of uh, to improve on that and recognize her as a founding mother. Anyway, that would certainly very much astonish Jefferson, and as would the idea that African Americans can be both um, emancipated and, um, and uh, still on American soil. Uh, a contingency he very much doubted. And finally, and I say this with some gravity in, in Michigan, he would look you in the eye with great reproach at the fact that Canada remains unconquered. <laughs> and I have to take the opportunity while I'm here to say that what has the youth of Michigan been doing all these years? Is there no pride? Is there no... Where is the gallantry? Where is the, where is the spirit of national self-sacrifice? I hope when I come back here when something will have been done about the Canadian question. I plant this seed now. Uh, it is actually pretty outrageous that Her Majesty the Queen is still recognised as the head of state anywhere on the, on the North American continent. I came here to get away from all that, as did most of your ancestors, and I, I leave the thought with you. Well, <laughs> in order for us to approach Mr. Jefferson properly, I think one has to uh, do it under, 
I, it's a, it can be a mistake to announce how many headings are going to speak under, but I will let you know, and I'll be as terse as I can, four of them. Uh, the Enlightenment, uh, nation building, uh, war and revolution, and uh, slavery. Um, and to start with the Enlightenment, I, I think one could say that if, um, if 18th century Philadelphia was not exactly 5th century Athens, it was nonetheless a very remarkable city at a very remarkable time and a magnet for all kinds of talent, um, not just intellectual and philosophical, but practical and medical, if you like, scientific. Uh, to it were drawn uh, people from all over the world. Um, my favorite example would be that of Joseph Priestley, who I think can really lay claim to having discovered oxygen, who when his laboratory was destroyed, his profane instruments were destroyed by a mob of Church and King the Tories in Birmingham. Uh, for his Unitarian opinions, his uh, heretical views, his support for the American and French revolutions. In other words, he was burned out in his laboratory, destroyed in his own country. He took ship and came to Philadelphia, where he was made extremely welcome and became a major contributor to the life of the city. Thomas Paine was wafted over to Philadelphia in the same way, the most unacknowledged of our founding fathers, subject of my next book, uh, with a letter from Benjamin Franklin in his pocket recommending him to people and very soon became part of the the ferment of the, of, the, of the bookshop and cafe and coffee house and ale house culture that was to lead to the incubation of, of the artisan form of the, of the American Revolution and, and the wonderful pamphlets that led uh, to it. Benjamin Franklin, of course, is the senior citizen of all this. Um, and Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Rush, a great physician, are, are others. The, the polymathic nature of Mr. Jefferson is what has to strike anyone who reads about it, let alone someone who tries to write about it. This is a guy who could have been, well, very nearly was, and in fact was for a time, a very excellent lawyer. He could have been the greatest lawyer of his day very easily. He could have been and was a very great architect. Uh, he was a very distinguished botanist, uh, exchanged clippings and cuttings of plants and uh, flowers from all over, and understood grafting and, and other matters, which I must say I don't. Um, though he was good at viniculture, which I do have an interest, and though Virginia wines are still not yet quite up to snuff, <laughs> they're a lot better than the Connecticut Chardonnay, I can assure you of that. <laughs> you know there's a, there's a winery now in every single state of this union? I think that's something we should all be very proud of. That wasn't true. <laughs> but he, he, he understood a great deal about how to transplant grapes and matters of this sort. He was able to advise Dr. Jenner, um, the <clears throat> man who discovered how to inoculate people against the great scourge of the day, uh, smallpox on how to transport this vaccine without it losing its potency by finding a means of keeping it cool for, for transport. He, of course, had to fight off people like Timothy Dwight of Yale, Dr. Dwight, still a celebrated divine for some reason, who said it was wrong to try the cowpox inoculation because it would be an interference with God's design. And I suppose if you believe in God's design, smallpox has to be an integral part of it. Uh, it's not designed by anybody else, um, which is a, a, a theme to which I must return in a second, when a matter of uh, a treaty on the whaling industry needed to be resolved, Mr. Mr. Jefferson was involved in the negotiation of it, he wrote a treatise on whaling in order to be sure that he was fully informed on all points. I'm acutely aware that I've left out a couple of his other attainments. Well, I should mention one very salient one, paleontology. He lived in a pre-Darwinian time, and he and other uh, early paleontologists like de Buffon in France spent a lot of time wondering about things that we don't have to wonder about. But, uh, how did the seashells get so high up on the mountain, for example? They had no means of knowing this. But within the limits of a pre-Darwinian world, he, he did a, a, a great deal of work on, on what a Darwinist would easily recognize as origins of species and, uh, and on the age of um, the, the terrestrial globe. Uh, he was an excellent writer, I need hardly add. He designed. Uh, first, one of the first copying machines, multiple pen machine, um, and of course would have been a marvelous librarian. The Library of Congress is still built, in a sense, to the to the model of indexing and reference that he designed for his own library in Monticello. A, a real Renaissance man, in other words, and a real man of the Enlightenment, by which I mean that what was being gradually apprehended by all of these uh, medicine men, men of medicine, uh, scientists, innovators, engineers experimenters with electricity and lightning and so on, was that it was no longer possible to believe that
that we were simply at the mercy of the elements or of some capricious divine plan that within within our grasp it suddenly appeared to humans for the, really for the very first time was the possibility of improving our nature and our lot not as a dream and not as something to be done by exhortation or self penalization but as an actual project an enlightenment project of spreading knowledge and information to raise the the floor upon which humanity had been had been dwelling and this was of the, of the very first importance in incubating our revolution and in, and in forwarding the ideas of the Enlightenment in the New World. And we're rightly grateful that such an extraordinary constellation of talent and, and industry was all available at one place at the same time. And a very important conclusion that followed from this self-emancipation of humans by knowledge and science and other fields of endeavor the realization that there was such a thing as a germ theory of disease rather than an evil spirit theory of disease or a curse theory of disease, for example, was that they had to reconsider the place of the divine in the cosmos. Um, I think I can say pretty certainly that Alexander Hamilton was the only one of the founding fathers to have a priest at his bedside when he died. And that was because there was a squabble among the priests as to who should attend him in his last agony as he died from Aaron Burr's bullets in his abdomen. And there was also a squabble among some priests who said that they wouldn't attend the bedside of a man who would be engaged in dueling. So the, the vulgarity of that hardly uh, makes a very grand exception to my, my general rule, which is these, these men were not Christians. Uh, most of them were, uh, I think, not even deists. I, I think I'd be willing to argue that Thomas Jefferson, most of the time, was an atheist, though he had to keep it a very Quiet. Um, for example, I'll, I'll just add slightly to the list of his attainments. Um, after he's been in power for 25 years, which is after he's been governor of Virginia and after he's written the Declaration of Independence, after he's retired from the White House, in other words, uh, still ahead of him is the achievement of creating the University of Virginia at Charlottesville, the first secular university in the country, and the authorship of what we call the Jefferson Bible, which the Unitarian Church can and still we will give you a copy of, and so will Congress if you go and ask for one for free. And this uh, consists of the exercise of taking a Bible in one hand and a razor blade in the other, and cutting out all the bits that are fantastic, unbelievable, inconsistent, or outright damnably immoral, which, as you will see when you look at the book, leaves you with a very slender volume indeed. <laughs> <laughs> which uh, this exercise he could do in Greek and Hebrew and Latin as well as in English, of course, and did, um, but didn't dare publish it in his lifetime when asked why he was doing it, said he was trying to uh, think of a simplifying Bible to help to convert the Indians, which showed that the other thing that can be depressing about writing about Jefferson, um, which is in general the absence in him of any very highly developed sense of humor, uh, wasn't completely absent. When present, was very dry indeed. So the necessary counterpart of the Enlightenment culture and atmosphere from which Jefferson originates is the idea of the secular state. The, the republic where the government takes no side in religious disputes, no view of religion, and doesn't intervene to establish any church. And the, the three achievements that Jefferson wanted noted on his obelisk at Monticello, which I'm sure some of you have seen, were only the following, that he'd been the author of the Declaration of Independence, the founder of the University of Virginia, and the author of the Virginia Statute on Religious Freedom. He didn't think it worth mentioning that he'd been Secretary of State vice president and twice president of the United States. Only those three achievements. And of the three, I think the third may be the one of which he was the proudest. Because the Virginia Statute on Religious Freedom, which says that in place of a state, Virginia, that had tithed people only to support the Anglican Church, the Church of England, there would not instead be, as Patrick Henry and others had suggested, a state that uh, supported all churches out of tithes. Everyone had to pay to support all churches. Instead, there would be, logically, and philosophically and morally correctly, a state that supported no churches, left them to support themselves and, and protected them from each other and everyone from anyone who didn't want to go. Uh, no other country in the world, in the history of the world, has ever adopted this as its constitutional practice. And it sometimes seems to me that Americans aren't grateful enough or aware even enough of their good luck in living in a country where that is the case. And the battle for that statute on religious freedom waged by Jefferson and Madison is, I think, the summa of what was learned and derived from the Enlightenment <coughs> of Philadelphia and, the, and the, the brilliant way in which they were able to seize that moment to write the Declaration and the founding documents. And, 
and make sure that we are heirs to this day of that enlightenment moment. So that's under that heading. And I hope it might elicit a question or two or a comment. <clears throat> On the question of, of uh, nation building, it's somewhat equivalent. Jefferson thought that the United States should be a strong country in order to defend these Enlightenment ideas from the encroachments of barbarism and from the existing empires that still dominated not just Europe, but the Atlantic and most of North and South America. Remember in his day, when he first became president, the United States was to North America what roughly what Chile is uh, on the other side of the continent of our southern cone uh, neighbor. In other words, a long, thin, literal country running north-south, clinging to the coastline just between the mountains and the sea. That's, that, the United States could have ended up looking like that. Uh, Jefferson was absolutely determined that this not be the case, that, that there would be as much expansion as possible of the ideas of the Constitution into the new territories and the expansion of, of population, the encouragement of people to, to reproduce and to have the fortitude and the optimism to move out and spread the word. <clears throat> and he cared about this uh, so much that he was able to sacrifice one of his most cherished principles to it. His most cherished princi principle as President and as Secretary of State was to defend the French Revolution from the British Empire at almost any cost. In fact, most of his great political mistakes were made from underestimating how badly the Jacobins had debauched the French Revolution. He wouldn't, in a way, agree to hear bad news from Paris in their years and was a fierce partisan of the French uh, against the British in all matters, until an event which we don't pay enough homage to occurred. Um, I don't think Americans are aware of the debt that they owe to the slave rebellion that took place in Santo Domingo, what we now call Haiti, in the 1790s, led by the first real slave general in history since Spartacus, uh, Toussaint Louverture, inspired by the ideas of the French Revolution, but directed against French <coughs> colonial rule. And the effort required to put down this slave rebellion, which is brilliantly described by C.L.R. James in his wonderful history called Black Jacobins, cost the French almost a whole army and a whole fleet, not just because of the extraordinary resistance of the slaves, but also because of the terrible climate and, and the climatic and health conditions on the island, and forced them to, into a position where they had to consider selling what they had in North America to some party or other. And Jefferson, through his envoys, made it very clear to Mr. Talleyrand and others in Paris, if you do not sell this territory to the United States, uh, we're willing to make a military alliance with, with Great Britain against you. In other words, he would, he would sacrifice his most cherished allegiance in order to increase the power, the strength, and the extent of the United States. And by this brilliant maneuver, backed up with a, with a believable threat, he induced Napoleon and Talleyrand to sell not just the port of New Orleans, and thus finally to grant America access to its heartland of the Mississippi. Uh, but everything that France had in North America, which had the effect, as uh, Henry Adams puts it, of doubling the size of the United States in one day for five cents an acre, a fairly extraordinary achievement. And uh, you all probably know the influence of the, of the date, the 4th of July in Jefferson's life. First, it's the Declaration of Independence. Second, it's the day on which both he and John Adams die. Uh, in different parts of the country. But it's also, I found in my research, is a very significant day in another, in another sense. On the 4th of July, when the very 4th of July, when the Louisiana Purchase was announced in the official Gazette in Washington, uh, Jefferson issued the orders to Lewis and Clark to leave town, go to Pittsburgh, and move out to the West. This had been very long prepared and was, in my opinion, properly classifiable as a, an Enlightenment expedition. Lewis and Clark had been sent to Philadelphia by, by Jefferson. They were there to be taught how to navigate by the stars, how to administer injections against smallpox to Indians. Very important, uh, as Jefferson had to everyone on his estate, incidentally, in Monticello, including all the slaves. Um, how to master some elementary Indian languages. Jefferson had drawn up a taxonomy of the existing Indian tongues. In print, we've lost it. It was all swept away in a flood. We'll never get it back again. It's a terrible thing to know that Jefferson was, came as near as could be to codifying and, and understanding and writing down Indian, Indian languages. They were taught that. They were taught how to conduct very simple medical operations. Uh, Benjamin Rush, um, a, a great physician, uh, trained them in, in, in medicine too. They were to set off to collect samples of fossils and bones uh, 
um, and plants and trees um, and animals uh, for the greater enlightenment of the East Coast and the greater expansion of the United States. The, the word for doing this when Napoleon went to Egypt and the British went to India was Orientalism. And I would say Jefferson deserves to be credited with Occidentalism. He wanted not to conquer the West, but to explore it, to assimilate it, to, to sh share our knowledge with it and to acquire its knowledge for ourselves. And he told them, as they set off, when you, uh, when you encounter the leaders of the Indian peoples, as you will, you are to, as I've always told you, treat them with great courtesy and great respect. But you may also tell them, as of today, because the, this was the day the purchase had been announced in Louisiana, that they already live in the United States. And they may not know it, but they do. And that the reign of French and Spanish and British empires on this continent is over forever and is never coming back. And armed with that, was the greatest expedition of enlightenment ever mounted, set off on the 4th of July. I think it's a nice coincidence. I don't believe there's a special providence for the United States, but sometimes I'm tempted to think about it. <laughs> uh, so that's quite an achievement for a president. In other words, by the end of his presidency, the country He's not president of the same state or the same country. He's president of a vastly larger empire um, and, a, and a very rapidly expanding dominion. And it's, it's evident by then because he's talked to people who are thinking about Alaska and the Northwest Passage and California. It's, it's evident by the time he's over that, yes, we will find, we will find the West Coast and it will, we will have a continental-sized republic. And it will only be a matter of time before uh, Quebec and Ontario see reason. Um, <laughs> and want to join in. And if they don't, they'll be cursed. Well, this is very important in my third uh, subject, heading, which is that of war and revolution. I've more or less dealt with the revolutionary side of it. I mean that Jefferson's concept of war was a revolutionary one. Um, he was the first president ever to send American forces overseas. <clears throat> and he'd been planning to do it for a very long time. Because the state of affairs was as follows. Um, it's been calculated by the best, most recent historians that between the years roughly, say, 1750 to 1815, perhaps a million and a half Americans and Europeans were kidnapped and sold into slavery by what we then called the Barbary powers of North Africa. That's to say, the North African states of the Ottoman Empire, which would be now Morocco, Algeria, Libya, and Tunisia, um, known as the Barbary States, partly because of the large Berber population in that part of North Africa. <coughs> partly because Barbary is a good propaganda word because it sounds like barbarian. Um, and the method by which this slavery was imposed was that of piracy. Uh, American and European commerce going through the Straits of Gibraltar the Pillars of Hercules, the approaches, in other words, of the Atlantic to the Mediterranean and the Mediterranean to the Atlantic, controlled at this narrow point by these Muslim navies, which could impose their will, take the cargo, sell the captives into slavery, or sometimes, unlike the unfortunates from Africa who were sent over on the Middle Passage, sometimes also to offer to redeem them from slavery in return for cash payments, or to avoid enslaving them altogether in return for bribes up front. Most European powers would pay this tribute and did, and after the protection of the British flag was withdrawn from American shipping, there's good evidence that the British rather encouraged when they paid over their bribes, the Barbary states to particularly attack American shipping, make a special target of it. This meant that the very infancy of the United States, the possibility of free trade in the new world or with the old world was, was vitiated. It was an intolerable state of affairs. Most presidents, including Adams, had decided to make their peace with it. Uh, but Jefferson not. Um, he went to see the uh, ambassador. I'll just quote something here for a moment, if I can interrupt myself. As early as 1786, when he was stationed in Paris, he went to see the Barbary ambassador in London, in Grosvenor Square, and demanded to know of him by what right he made war on American vessels and enslaved American citizens. After all, the United States had not taken part in the Crusades. The United States had not taken part in the Reconquista, the the driving of Islam out of Spain and Andalusia. Uh, they, there was, the United States had no quarrel with the Muslim world, as many of the European countries had. This was the reply the ambassador gave, and I'm quoting from the report Jeff Jefferson sent to Congress and to John Jay in March 1786. The ambassador answered us, that's him and Adams. The ambassador answered us that their right to this enslavery 
and so forth, was founded on the laws of the Prophet, that it was written in their Quran that all nations who should not have answered their authority were sinners, that it was their right and their duty to make war upon them wherever they could be found, and to make slaves of all they could take as prisoners. I don't think that anything could have struck Jefferson as more hateful than the combination of hereditary monarchs dominating as, uh, as caliphate and sultan uh, <coughs> the northern African countries and professing a religion that allowed for the enslavement of Americans. It was really, for him, the almost perfectly defined enemy. And as soon as he was elected president, he dispatched the United States fleet and the United States Marines to bombard uh, Tripoli and the other capital cities of North Africa until this practice was ended. And it was actually an extremely successful expedition. Within a very short time, not only had the forts and um, uh, vessels of the Barbary pirate states been reduced, um, especially in a very famous encounter that some of you would have read about with Stephen Decatur's a, a great battle in the harbor. Uh, but the more important, perhaps in some ways, the, the British fleet and the French fleet and the Spanish fleet in the Mediterranean and the Atlantic suddenly noticed there was a new power on the other side of the world and that it was a naval power and that it had a very efficient and deadly marine corps and that it wouldn't be pushed around, and in fact could not be. And this was a lesson that they had not hitherto had any cause to assimilate. So though Mr. Jefferson did not go for regime change exactly in these uh, Islamic theocratic terrorist countries, he did insist on policy change and on enforcing it at Cannon Point. And so righteous was he about this that he didn't think there was any real point in troubling Congress with this um, bothersome matter. It didn't inform them that he sent the expedition until it was so far out to sea that it could not be recalled, um, thus stilling the chance of Federalist opposition and doing his favorite of all things, the fait accompli, as with Louisiana, so that by the time anyone wanted to complain, it was too late. Um, I think that's a, uh, it's possibly a very ambivalent lesson, but it showed uh, that for Jefferson, as for Thomas Paine and many others, uh, there was um, an absolute concrete alliance in their minds between the ideas of liberty, the enlightenment, the secular constitution, and the spreading of these around the world, if necessary, by force. There is no doubt in my mind that these men thought the American Revolution was very definitely for export, and that they would support anyone uh, who was willing to stand by those ideas in South America, in Europe, or elsewhere. And that this, it is for that reason, I think, that the American Revolution is the only revolution that re retains any exemplary or inspirational power. And it would be nice just to stop there, but I can't because I haven't done slavery yet. And in all the three topics I've just mentioned, uh, unfortunately, uh, slavery obtrudes itself in all of them. Uh, obviously, it's a huge negation of the Enlightenment. Uh, the idea that the Enlightenment is the project for the emancipation of the whole human being uh, and, the, and the nobility with which that idea is expressed in the Declaration of Independence is clearly flatly negated by chattel slavery. And, and Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Paine and Benjamin Rush were, as Jefferson was not, members of the American Anti-Slavery Society. Jefferson did try and have a prohibition of the trade written into the Declaration. He lost because the votes of Georgia and the Carolinas were needed for there to be 13 colonies. And there were powerful interests also in New York and Massachusetts, who, while they didn't own slaves, profited very greatly from trafficking in them. So there is, a, there is, if you like, I don't like the phrase, but it's an indispensable one. There is an original sin um, at the beginning of the American Eden, and it's a sin that's very, very hard to efface. So obviously, it, it, this qualifies and compromises what one wants to say about the Enlightenment, and it's true also in Jefferson's own personal life, that this, this issue of chattel slavery runs through his own garden, his own living room, his own bedroom, in a way that was, well, unmistakable. Uh, it also affects the question of nation building, uh, because when, it, when Thomas Paine, who'd had the idea of the Louisiana Purchase, Jefferson may have had the idea independently, but Paine certainly wrote him a letter um, on Christmas Day uh, urging him to take advantage of French difficulties and make a, what he called a moneyed proposal to, to Napoleon to double the size of the United States, added to his friend and, and to the president, that this created another opportunity. The United States could be begun again, so to speak, could be made over anew, 
and this time no slavery should be allowed in the new territories. And Payne begged the president and said, please don't allow any more slaves or any more slavery in the Louisiana territories. Send some thrifty German Lutheran immigrants and get them to break the soil and, and give, the, uh, freed, uh, give the freed slaves, the ones who are there already, who've been toiling for other nations, give them land of their own, uh, four acres and a mule, as it were, avant de la lèche. Uh, give them a break, give them, give the, 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 the sons and daughters of Africa a new deal. Joel Barlow, another great friend of Jefferson's, urged very much the same point in very much the same uh, terms. But um, just as not all machinery uh, that's labor-saving and productive is uh, liberating, just as Eli Whitney's cotton gin had actually made slavery more profitable by making cotton more profitable and easier to bring in so that the enlightenment and machinery and technical innovation don't all run one way. So it wasn't the cotton lobby, but the sugar lobby that won in Louisiana. Somebody had to get that cotton, excuse me, that sugar cut, that sugar cane in. Otherwise, Jefferson feared other Caribbean countries would outdo the United States in the sugar business, and that meant keeping the slaves at work. And indeed, worse than that, unloading new ones at the port of New Orleans, a discovery that when it was made very nearly broke Thomas Paine's heart. So not only was the, the original sin, the original stain, spread and extended, uh, but by the carving of new states and the cloning, if you like, of new states from the Louisiana Territory, which began very quickly, the, 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 mo the momentum was begun by which, by the time Jefferson died, the number of slave states in the Union was approximately equal, and finally, as you know, with Missouri compromise, became equal to the number of non-slave states. And at that point, we know that one of Jefferson's legacies to us is going to be the Civil War. And that later, late, later presidents and later Americans will have to deal with what he's left uh, behind us. And it's no story, uh, no account of his, either of his enormous importance in our history or of his immensely contemporary relevance would be complete, I think, without that and without some reflection on how personally and individually this subject was imbricated with his own life. The great... Um, uh, a great uh, a poet, Horace, uh, used to say, um, De te uh, fabula narrator. Uh, no, he used to say, to be exact, mutato nomine. Mutato nomine et de te fabula narrator. Change only the name, and the story is about you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this story is about you and about all of us, and I hope we'll have some time to discuss it further, and I'm very grateful to you for coming. screening them, are we, or anything? <laughs> okay, boring questions will be torn up. Um, I don't mind if people want to get up and ask a question, but I, I, I yield to whatever the etiquette is here. Okay, well, uh, all of you, I think, have a card where you could write down a question. If you want to write your question down, pass it to the end, and then they'll be collected. Uh, they will not be edited out, but we get so many questions that tend to be the same. That this would be a good way to organize them. Uh, while you're doing that, I'd like to ask the first question. So. Uh, write it down. And you, asked, it down. you asked for that. <laughs> what could President Bush, or what should President Bush most learn from Mr. Jefferson? Well, um, in, in my opinion, he has uh, already um, adopted one Jeffersonian position which is to say that the existence of theocratic uh, terrorist states and movements is um, incompatible with the existence of the United States. Coexistence with these forces is not possible, which I would add is a good thing, because it's not desirable either. Um, and in, I don't know if, if uh, President Bush knows anything at all about this struggle, say, over the Barbary Coast or any of these other questions or whether it's just instinct in him, but he seems to have taken the position that there's no compatibility. There'll, there'll have to be a fight about it. Um, and 
in a praiseworthy manner, in my view. Um, I think that he, uh, as a Republican, might, well, might not want to have, cite Jefferson as his authority, but the, the idea that the United States should make it its business, should interest itself in the spreading of democratic ideas, is certainly a Jeffersonian one, it's not a Federalist one. And uh, to that extent, probably rather um, unwelcome to the president. Well, I mean, I think we can say for sure it's unwelcome, because when he ran against um, Vice President Gore, um, Mr. Bush and Mr. Cheney, as you remember, ran as isolationists who were opposed to nation building, opposed to the dispatch of American troops on humanitarian missions, in favor of the lifting of sanctions on Iraq and on Libya and so forth. So that their, their conversion while in office to a form of um, American, uh, I don't know quite what the word is, idealistic, well, some people call it Wilsonian, Jefferson Wilsonian interventionism is a, is a remarkable thing to have seen. And the fact that it is rather made up as it goes along and has come to its practitioners as a surprise and isn't exactly what they had in mind in the first place can be seen from the extreme incompetence with which the policy has been implemented. <laughs> well, at least that takes care of one argument, which is that they, they, they would, they'd been conspiring to do this all along. I can promise you that's not. Is the current war, is uh, a clash of civilizations uh, inevitable into the future between Islam and the West? Yes. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, there's no, there's no, um, let me put it like this. Some people say, in fact, there's recently been what's, I think, preposterously called a national intelligence estimate about this. Estimate is certainly the right word. Um, it's, not, it's not in any sense a finding. It's a piece of subjective Im impression mongering. But the, the, anyway, the finding or the, the uh, whatever the word I'm looking for, the um, estimate is that a great number of Muslims are annoyed by our policy and that thus, um, and violently so, and thus we are to a certain extent, another, a, a word I also distrust, less safe. Quite how safety is measured. In, in this, or by what, what means it's uh, estimated, is quite beyond me. I mean, it seems to me, that if one asks a question like, does going to war make one more safe? One asks a question that is flat out incoherent, um, and will elicit, if asked, stupid answers, which is what we have been getting from our intelligence community <laughs> in any case for the last two or three decades. Um, however, let's, suppose, let's, let's say, all right, um, we should take care not to make enemies. Well, what care would we have to take? Let me give you the instance of Denmark. Small Northern European democracy. Multicultural, open-hearted, large immigrant population. Um, no history of imperialism in the Middle East. Spends most of its diplomatic efforts and money in the region on helping the Palestinians. Um, has its embassies burned, its diplomatic immunity violated, uh, in countries, by the way, in the capital cities of dictatorships that normally don't allow demonstrations of any kind. Uh, Danish embassies are put to the torch. Uh, random Danes and other Scandinavians who might look Danish are hunted down the streets and killed. Danish diplomats are violated. Uh, a, a conscious, very well-organized attempt, supported by several leading Arab governments, is made by sanctions and boycotts to destroy the quite vulnerable Danish economy, um, and so on. Um, and what is the ground of grievance here? That the Prime Minister of Denmark will not break Danish law by intervening to stop the publication of cartoons in an evening paper in Copenhagen. Now, that's all it takes to make enemies, you understand. And it seems to me that people who say, let's not make enemies under these conditions are being flat out masochistic. Sure, we can avoid their ire, just as long as we're willing to destroy everything that makes our society different from theirs. Well, I'm not ready to do that. I'd rather fight it out, if it takes all my life. Okay. And I'll tell you how we'll know, which is when they start asking themselves, was it wise of us to piss off the Americans? <laughs> Have we made too many American enemies? Have we stirred up the American street? That's what I want to hear them discussing. 
And I want to hear them discussing, can we go on taking these casualties? Because the Americans, we don't boast about it. But your fellow countrymen and mine are killing these people at the rate of hundreds a week and willing to go on killing them at a higher rate, I hope. And at some point, they have to ask themselves, can we take it? That's the estimate I want to hear being made. I don't want to hear all this <coughs> dribbling lamentation where we've hardly started the business of training an army that knows how to fight these people and to defend our civilization in the most tough conditions of rogue and failed states. So um, I have very little doubt of what Mr. Jefferson would say about that. But I don't feel I have the right to ventriloquize him on my side. Quite happy to speak for myself on the point. <laughs> Uh, Bob Woodward, what do you think of Bob Woodward's new book about the Bush administration? Not much. I mean, <laughs> it's another piece of, of his seasonal stenography. Um, this time from a different lot, he's, he's channeling a different group within the administration. You, um, if you read the first book, um, I've written a long piece about this in the Atlantic, which you can look up about the style, different styles and books of Bob Woodward and the various mutations it undergoes, but you can very easily tell who his sources are. Um, for example, in the case of this first book, I can tell that George Tenet, then head of the Central Intelligence Agency, was a source because he's described as the hard-striving son of hard-scrabbling Greek immigrants. <laughs> and he's also quoted uh, quite a lot of the time in his, own, uh, in his own quote marks. Not all the quotes are blind, which is, by the way, how we know a very interesting thing about Mr. Tenet. Um, which I'll share with you if you like. Do, do you remember what Tennant said when he saw the towers being hit? Do you remember this? It's in Woodward's book. It's worth looking it up. I mean, not, it's not a waste of time reading his stuff. You've got some interesting material all the same if you can winnow it out. Um, Mr. Tennant is having breakfast with former Senator David Boren of Oklahoma, who had been his great patron on the Intelligence Committee for a while. And they're chatting on. And I, I'm willing to accept Tennant's word in the book that they were talking about the danger of Al-Qaeda. Maybe they were. It's not, not impossible. And then the, the, the men with the earpieces come piling into the room. They came running in. It's clear that the uh, director of Central Intelligence is not late for his next meeting. Something has happened. And they turn on the television and they see it happen. And so we know exactly what the first words said by any American intelligence official were in the first few moments of the post-9-11 era. And you know what the words were? Gee, I hope it's not those guys in the flight schools in the Midwest. Not quite good enough, is it? I mean, you would, I bet, I can think why he would hope it wasn't them. Because he was the only one who knew they were there. But he didn't think it was important enough to share the information with the FBI or to do anything about it. I don't think he should have got a Medal of Freedom for that, I have to say. In fact, I don't think he should have been allowed to resign. I think he should have been fired, and I think he should probably have been impeached. But um, I digress. I mean, in other words, you can find these nuggets in Woodward's book, but as you can see, tons of you must have read that book, but it's so boring you didn't notice that incredible <laughs> confession. <laughs> I get paid to read these books, unlike you, so I've got, <laughs> I have more of an incentive. Next question, is democracy possible in the Middle East where Islam is such an integral part both the society and the government. Well, I agree with Jefferson that it, there's something antithetical about between religion and democracy in, in any case, um, and religion and enlightenment and the other things that you need for a democratic society, because I think that the, the principal thing is secularism, and it is, it is a lot harder to convince Muslims, um, or can be a lot harder to convince Muslims of the importance of the secular for two reasons. One they claim that their revelation, the revelation to their prophet, is the last and final and irreplaceable one. Uh, it completes all previous revelations. It cannot be altered. It cannot be improved. It's absolute, and no other books are required. Uh, no other guidance is needed than that. And that it's a total solution for every aspect of life, from the sexual to the dietary to the political to the um, economic. Um, and the extreme form this takes is the desire to re-establish not a democracy, but an empire. The, there are some fools on the left who talk about Osama bin Laden and others as if they were anti-imperialist. Of course, they are fighting to create, in fact, more properly to recreate a lost empire, 
uh, the caliphate that was ended in 1918, um, and to bring, in theory, everyone in the world under its rule and the rule of Sharia. And that's as good a description as you could come up with for a totalitarian scheme, a totalitarian fantasy. So no, while this idea is abroad, um, it, it's going to be extremely difficult. Uh, to impose democracy, which is why the first and most important priority is, is, the, is the destruction, physical destruction and discredit of the jihad movement. That has to be beaten and, and eradicated before any progress can be even discussed. And this fight will take place on our own soil, so you better be ready for it. It's not a matter of democracy just in the Middle East. We're being asked, um, we will be asked again. Um, being asked in, in Western Europe and it, as near to here as Ontario whether maybe Muslims should have separate courts for Sharia and whether we should amend our practices of free speech and free inquiry in the academy and elsewhere so as not to offend them. And don't, don't you think that this demand is going to be dropped? It's not going to be. It's going to be advanced more and more aggressively and it'll be backed more and more obviously by the threat of force. Uh, not one, I'm ashamed to say it on behalf of my profession, not one American newspaper or network agreed to show those Danish cartoons, for example, even as an objective news story. Here, in a media which, let's face it, is pretty much image-driven now, not exactly word-dominated. The image is all, here's a big fight about an image. Well, what image? We're not going to tell you. Now, I know these people. I know the people who take these decisions, and I know it wasn't out of respect for Muslim sensitivity. It was out of sheer fear in the United States. Publishers of CNN, the Washington Post, people I talked to, openly saying they did not have, they were afraid to do their jobs, and plausibly so, and crying before they were hurt. So don't think it hasn't started. You either have to get used to it or say you won't put up with it. You have, and there's not much wiggle room, I think, between these two things. Please comment on President Bush's use of the word Islamofascism. It's one of the terms he's tried out um, <laughs> because we haven't got yet, maybe we don't need a name for the war. Um, there are some on the, on the right who are calling it already the long war with capital L. Just, let's just call it that, the long war. Something about that, the sort of bleak and economical, slightly appeals to me. It's obviously, I don't need to waste any time saying why it's not a war on terrorism. Um, it wouldn't be true to say it's a war with Islam because it's the product of a civil war within the Islamic world where the extremists are trying to win, conquer first their own side, their own people, their own co-religionists, that's to say, just as most of the victims of the Taliban were Afghan, not American, um, and most of the victims of uh, jihadism in Iraq are Iraqi, not American. Uh, they hope to reduce their own population to slavery, and they hope to do it partly by impressing them with their willingness and ability to fight with us. So to encompass all that in a word is very, very difficult. Um, I wrote on, I'm sometimes blamed for this uh, currency, um, this, excuse me, the currency of this coinage. I wrote uh, immediately after September the 11th that I thought what had happened in New York was fascism with an Islamic face. Again, you can't say that every time. Um, so some people have collapsed it into Islamo-fascism and, and said that I invented it, which, which I didn't. But I would justify it as a resistance to the totalitarian in the way that I just described, the, the caliphate and the sharia law and the imposition of laws on every aspect of human behavior and conduct as implicitly totalitarian. And aggressive, because it mandates war against unbelievers. So it's a society organized for war. It doesn't say we just want to do this to Muslims. It says we want to spread and conquer. Um, it is um, to say that it was infected with the most toxic forms of anti-Jewish paranoia would be the saying the least one could say about it. These people have absolutely in common with national socialists and fascists. They believe in a secret, all-powerful Jewish world government headquartered in the United States. Uh, that they believe in the worship of one leader and the study of only one book strikes me as suggestive as well. The alliance that it allows between the extremely rich uh, and the extremely poor and downtrodden is an exact replica of the exploitation of unemployment and misery and ignorance by the, by the powerful cartels and generals and aristocrats in Germany and Russia and, excuse me, Germany and Austria and uh, Italy 
uh, speaking the language of populism when it suited them. It strikes me almost classically um, fascistic, and I'm sure that you now I've got this far, some of you can think of some parallels as well. It's, it's not um, at all like fighting the Cold War. You're not up against an enemy that understands self-interest and self-preservation. Indeed, the most frightening and I think the most reassuring thing about it is that, like fascism, it's extremely irrational. It has a cult of death, for example. It's not by accident that suicide is its most consecrated act, its most exalted act. Um, it, it is highly superstitious and, and irrational, and it makes insane decisions. Um, I don't think that any one of bin Laden's uh, acolytes can now really wish uh, that they had attacked the World Trade Center. They didn't know that within a very short time they would lose the two governments in the region that most favored them, that so many of their militants would be dead or in prison or on the run. Uh, they expected the United States to buckle very easily. Um, and it's why it's very important. I think it's the duty of every citizen to make sure that the rumor that the United States has no stomach for a fight and is run by mere hedonists who care only for the, their recreations and their most recent headlines and has no will uh, to resist. But it's very, very important that everyone think of their own way of disproving that proposition. Is the United States an empire? And if so, what kind of empire is it? <coughs> I, I, I've always believed, I've always argued that yes, it is an empire, and it, both in the positive and the, and in the negative sense of that term. Empire of Liberty was what Jefferson wanted to call the United States. It was one of his terms for it. He wanted, in other words, to have a, a continent-sized uh, country that would be a democracy. And he thought that its boundaries could be quite wide. I mean, I, I, Cuba could easily have been a part of Jefferson's Union if, if uh, he'd had the means to do it. Sometimes wonder if it wouldn't have been better than having Cuba as a semi-colony, which was the uh, uh, solution actually adopted. That Cuba got batted around between different empires and became, had no real autonomy or independence of its own, uh, could always be invaded um, or have a puppet government installed against which it rebelled and making the full step of transforming that into a Stalinist state. I mean, really, you know, I can't think how Cuba could be any worse off it if, if it had been American to begin with. But American imperialism of the other kind that just says, well, we'll treat Cuba as a semi-colony as part of our backyard has been a complete disaster. So in either declension of the term, empire is involved, yes. It means that you feel you have a right and sometimes a duty to interest yourselves in the societies and the economies of others. You have to be quite an arrogant son of a bitch to uh, think that. But I mean, where would America be without an arrogant sons of bitches? <laughs> improve its image in Middle Eastern countries? Shouldn't be bothered about that. It should worry, we should be um, asking ourselves what, uh, uh, they should be asking themselves what we think of them. That's what I mean to say. I'm, a, I'm a fed up with this sickly uh, masochism. Be more British about it, in other words. Uh, <laughs> so, this, um, I mean, my, my, line on, my line on this very simply being that it's absolutely no better to be English. Absolutely no better. But really, absolutely no worse, I think. Um, and you don't have to worry about whether people like you or not. Um, it's contemptible to keep asking yourself. It's like people taking opinion polls all the time. In mid-speech, they're saying, could I just interrupt? Is this speech making a good impression on you? Or not? <laughs> because I'm worried about my approval rating. I mean, we use these terms, we're making a rod for our own backs. No, no, have a little self-respect and you know, allow yourself to think that people who don't like you are probably jealous, okay? Could be true, could be true. Returning to Jefferson, there's an interesting question about the embargo of 1807. Why did Jefferson pursue that embargo so strenuously? I, look, I didn't have time for this and I was afraid I'd trespass on the our time if I went on in this way, but a thing I should have mentioned and thought of was that Jefferson and Payne were very much ahead of their time in thinking first of what was called by Payne uh, a confederation of nations, I can't remember. It's a, it's a prototype UN for the settlement of disputes by diplomacy and a concert of powers to enforce 
things like the reduction of the size of navies, but also, if, if necessary, to intervene to, uh, to support the independence of Spain's colonies in South America, which is one, would, would have been one of the projects, as was one of the great projects of the UN and the League of Nations decolonization. So Payne and Jefferson thought of that very early, um, and they also thought of using non, non-violent forms of warfare, non-military forms of warfare, economic warfare, in other words, the imposition of sanctions. Never been tried before. Um, and it's, it's a funny thing, actually. There are still people, Jeffersonians, who argue that that policy would have worked if sanctions had been given more time. They're still arguing that in 2006. And you never know. Maybe if sanctions had been given more time. There are indications that actually on the French they were beginning to have an effect before Congress called it off. It's possible. And the other thing that Jefferson hoped it would do, but it wasn't so much advertised in the program, was that it would encourage Americans to depend less on imports and force them to build up native industries and native uh, uh, manufacturing. At that, it did, uh, in the interior particularly, it did to some considerable extent. The main problem is the United States has such a long border and such a long coastline that the temptation to smuggle and to break the rules and not observe the embargo by everyone living in those neighborhoods was just too strong. So Jefferson found really that the electorate just wasn't good enough for him, which is a very bad position for a politician to get into. Please tell us about your next book. Um, Well, my next book is... um, well, the next book is published in England, but not yet here, is, is a study of Thomas Paine's uh, Rights of Man. So that's, that's on, already on the slipway, as it were, and, on, and um, perhaps available at fine Amazon.com anywhere, but not yet in bookstores unless you cross the border to Canada. But the, one, but the, but the next one that will be published in the United States is a book called, um, it's called God is Not Great. If you like, I'll tell you what it's about. But if you really ask after I've told you the title, um, I'd be sad, because I'm hoping the title will do the work, saying what the book is about. So it's called God is Not Great. It's a, it's a general plea for um, anti-theism and a defense of the secular republic against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Hmm? I, I heard. I heard some. No one seems comments to have asked a question. Um, yeah. Well, it begins by stating. Uh, well, the, the metaphysical claims of religion are false. It's a false promise. Um, the, the belief is an immoral belief, um, and because it seeks uh, solutions in the supernatural. It presents a false picture of reality because, in most cases, it, it depends on the immoral idea of vicarious atonement. It's particularly true of Christianity, the idea that, that your sins can be scapegoated onto somebody else. In other words, the abolition of personal responsibility you know, in favor of a false promise of eternal life, um, which would take the form of eternal slavery. In other words, you have in this eternal life only the right to praise the dear leader. Um, I've been to North Korea. I described my trip to North Korea, a country where the, pr- the president um, is a dead man, the father of, the, of Kim Jong Il, Kim Il-sung is still the president. Kim Jong Il is only the head of the state. Uh, the, excuse me, the party and the army. He, the head of state is his father, his late father. So North Korea is a kind of a necrocracy, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> Morsalocracy or um, thanatocracy. But uh, if you notice uh, when you're there, it's only one short of a trinity that runs this dump. And though all you have the right to do is praise the dear leader from dawn till dusk, it's like Christmas. You can't get away from it. Um, everywhere you go, every theater, every, there aren't many theaters, every cinema, there aren't many cinema, every workplace, every school, nothing but endless praise. And now I know what it would be like. Uh, but you can at least die and get out of North Korea. <laughs> Whereas what religion wants is for you to be under total and complete and permanent, inescapable surveillance from the moment before before you're conceived till way after you're dead. Now, all I ask you, who wants this? <laughs> who wishes that was true? Who wants a celestial North Korea? It's a disgusting <laughs> idea. <laughs> oh, it's a disgusting and, and immoral and indecent idea. It's very good, therefore, that there is absolutely no evidence that it's true. In fact, all the evidence is the other way. So I then produced some of the evidence, and then um, 
it's quite anti-Semitic, this book. Um, I, mean, I think Voltaire was right. Everything is a plagiarism of Judaism. The Jews come out of it very badly. Sorry, chaps. <laughs> Apologize to my mother, my grandmother, my wife, my daughter. But um, the Quran is even worse plagiarism of Judaism than, than the Bible is. But the, where everything went wrong is Hanukkah, if you want to know. Yeah. Yeah, now promote it again, re reinvent it so that Jewish children don't feel left out uh, by the sickly um, Santa Claus uh, obsequies. Um, that's the date on which the Maccabeans put down, rose and put down the Hellenized Jews, the Jews had basically given up on sacrifices of animals. Some of them had given up on circumcision, were looking towards Rome and Athens, were beginning to have, as it were, their enlightenment. And the Maccabees rebelled against them as traitors and Roman quislings and slaughtered them and very cruelly and restored the barbaric rituals of animal sacrifice and circumcision. And that's the worst day in human history, because if, if, the, if that had not happened, or if the, if the Hellenists in Palestine among the Jews had won, we could have skipped the whole thing. There'd be no Christianity. There would be no Islam. There would have obviously been cultish and barbaric religions and so on, but we would not have had uh, the connection broken between our civilization and the civilizations of ancient Athens and the Mediterranean. We wouldn't have blotted out the Mediterranean light from our society as we did for so many years of, of the Christian Dark Ages, uh, from which we have not yet recovered. So there's that, and then I say what I think about the Quran, um, which is currently the most dangerous religious text because it does make this extraordinary claim to be the last and final uh, and exclusive and unchangeable revelation. And that obviously has, as I've already told you, the most incredibly dire consequences. <clears throat> and then, oh no, it was much more. Um, <laughs> no, and then I'd say what I think the better tradition is. And a large, a large part of that is, is the work, well, ever since Democritus and Epicurus and the, the first people to work out that there was no God and that the cosmos is, and we are made of atoms. All the way through uh, the Enlightenment, uh, Jefferson, Paine, um, and up to the present day. And I, I, I show the common history, the, the thread of um, reason um, and atheism that, that has always been present in our society and try and, try and bring it to life for people. So um, I wish it was out now. I wish it was out for the Hanukkah market, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> markets and political markets, who would you like to see run for president in 2008? I hope it would, I would like it to be between um, John Edwards and Rudy Giuliani. That's what I would like to see. Um, I think uh, Mr. Roberts, who I know slightly, and his wonderful wife, are good people who are in politics for good reasons. That's very important. The only thing I've really learned from studying politics for 25 years in Washington is that the only thing that matters is character. Um, I used not to think that, because like you, probably, I used to nod as perhaps some of you have, when you hear someone saying, well, let's, not, let's discuss issues, not personalities. Sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds right, almost. Complete rubbish. Someone can say, here, I've got a health care plan. This is my issue. You can vote for them on that basis. But he doesn't have a health care plan. Right? He'd said that, so you'd vote for him. Right? What you didn't notice was what he couldn't change, which is he was a howling shit. <laughs> Psychopathic liar. And which, now, that's an issue. Don't tell me it's not an issue. If you elect a dog or a crook, it is an issue. Whereas the other stuff, they can change, believe you me. So keep an eye on the character question. It's the only thing a voter can make a really informed decision about. And it's the one thing they can't change about themselves. They're stuck with that. <laughs> Try as they may. And most people can, can get, I think, a fair reading of a person. Though I sometimes wonder about this, because to me, looking at, say, the face of Richard Nixon, it's as obvious as the reason why a child does not reach out to stroke a wasp. You, you don't... <laughs> You don't have to teach your children, don't be petting the wasp. They know not to pet them. But I know people who voted twice for Richard Nixon and twice for Bill Clinton. If you can't see written on someone's face what's coming, then I don't know. I can't help beyond that. But Edwards is, in, Edwards is a good guy. He's in politics for good reasons. He listens to his wife. He's very smart. 
and great principal. And Giuliani has, is mean and, um, and uh, rough. And I, I think we may need someone mean and rough at, at the helm, since I do quite genuinely believe that the Defense Department's name should be changed back to the Department of War. In fact, we should have done that already, and a few other things too, just to make it plain that there's no going back on this and there's no compromise available. So it probably would be good to have someone with a bit of bile in them, because it's actually quite difficult to fight a war if you don't in some sense relish the idea of it. Last question. This will be a nice one to end on. <laughs> what is the best Yeats poem? <laughs> the best Yeats poem is um, Easter 1916, I think. Which is um, which gives I've met I've met them at Great Day. Um, it's the poem he wrote to try and summarise the extraordinary passion of the moment of the of the proclamation of the Irish Republic at the post office on O'Connell Street in the middle of Dublin on, on Easter 1916 uh, to run up the flag and, and say to the whole British Empire we we we're leaving and there's nothing you can do about it. And to stand up to artillery fire, um, which they didn't think they didn't think the British would use artillery field guns in the middle of Dublin to put them down, but they did. And they didn't think that all of the people who signed the proclamation would be hanged, but they all were, except for Eamon de Valera, because he had an American passport, who later became the first president. And Yeats kept this poem a secret for three years. He didn't publish it till after the war was over, because he was afraid it might lead to violence. It's so intense, and it ends with telling off the names of the main martyrs of the Republic. And it ends, uh, I write it out in a verse, McDonough and McBride and Connolly and Pierce, now and in time to be, wherever green is worn, all changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born, which is the refrain. And it's very, very hard to recite without uh, going slightly husky. But and it's a work of genius, as well as a tremendous um, I was about to say political power. Yes, it is political. Historical, actually, historical power. But the, the flawless poem is a, a wartime, another wartime poem called um, An Irish Airman Foresees His Death, which I'm sure some of you know, which goes like this. Um, you have to picture an Irishman on the Western Front in this old biplane. Um, and it goes, I know that I shall meet my fate somewhere among the clouds above. Those whom I fight, I do not hate. Uh, those whom I guard, I do not love. My country is Kiltartan Cross. My countrymen, Kiltartan's poor. No likely end could bring them loss or leave them happier than before. No law nor duty bade me fight. No public men nor cheering crowds. A lonely impulse of delight drove to this tumult in the clouds I summoned all, brought all to mind. The years to come seem waste of breath. A waste of breath the years behind in balance with this life, this death. Voila. That's Mr. Yates. Christopher Hitchens. Uh, Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, very much. Christopher Hitchens will be available to sign books that are available out here for purchase. Yeah, no, I'm not going to be nice to anyone who hasn't got a receipt, sorry. <laughs> this is America, okay? <laughs> the pro bono bit is over. So, See you out there. thank you very much. Have a safe drive home.